Plant Center uh, seminar series. And uh, we are very grateful for your time. And probably if you were early, as we saw many of you joining the meeting, you heard us uh, trying to figure out a few technical details. So our apologies for that. But we are now uh, ready to start. Um, before I introduce our guest, I'd like to just uh, make a few points of uh, notes on, 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 on the webinar. You uh, will be able to ask questions and we will address the questions at the end. So please, if you do have questions, make sure that you write them down in the uh, chat and I will be uh, paying attention to them and ensure that the questions can be asked uh, towards the end of the, of the webinar. Uh, so without further ado, let me introduce the, our guest, Dr. Andrew Beck. Dr. Beck is an associate professor and attending pediatrician at Cincinnati Children's. He received his undergraduate degree in anthropology from Yale University, his medical degree from the University at Pittsburgh, and his MPH from Harvard University. He strives to improve population health outcomes by focusing on the identification and mitigation of key social, economic, and environmental determinants of health. He sees patients as a primary care and hospitalist pediatrician, pursues research and uh, quality improvement into equity achievement, and teaches actively in the College of Medicine and across Cincinnati Children's. For his efforts, he has been recognized with the Cincinnati Children's Junior Faculty Awards for Service, Advocacy, and Mentorship, and he has been recognized by the Cincinnati Business Courier as a member of the region's 40 under 40. Dr. Beck, we are really thankful for your time and uh, you are welcome into the Switzerland Seminar Series. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here. I'm sorry I couldn't be in Cleveland with you, but I suppose a virtual visit to Cleveland is, is among the next best thing. I'm also really gratified to hear that we have some um, people listening in from across the world. And, and I would just like to um, say how humbled I am that, that you'd listen in and um, welcome some discussion at the end about um, your experiences um, dealing with the pandemic uh, that we've all uh, been struck by. Um, but the topic at hand today as an introduction is really thinking about how we might move upstream toward prevention to identify and then act on both social and environmental drivers of inequities. And I will focus in large respect on asthma, but also uh, think about how that extends to how we might consider overall child health outcomes. So with that in mind, let me set some objectives. This will be in essence, the structure for how we work through uh, these topics over the next 45 minutes or so. One, I'd like to outline the rationale for population level initiatives, specifically using the example of asthma improvement as a way to leverage that discussion. I'd then like to illustrate the intersection between child health or child morbidity and the social and environmental determinants of health. And then I'd also like to think about how we might use these improvement strategies that are relevant for asthma and extend them to other pediatric conditions. And in so doing, I will uh, talk briefly about how some of these strategies um, have been applied to COVID-19 in our region. But I'd like to start with a case, one that I think is uh, particularly important to me and has uh, set the groundwork for much of the work that I do on a day-to-day -day basis, really motivated the work that I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And so let me uh, set the scene. Um, this is a case from my residency now about 10 years ago. Um, this is not a picture of the, of the girl or the patient that um, I will describe, but it might as well have been a vibrant uh, young nine-year-old in third grade who uh, was living her life here in our community. What did we know about her? Well, we have a, a child who has moderate persistent asthma. She was diagnosed at age four. Uh, she received primary care through our primary care centers, uh, was provided um, a prescription for fluticasone at her last primary care visit, which was two years before the encounter I'll describe. Uh, Follow-up at that visit was advised for four to six weeks, one to two months, um, but unfortunately uh, she was lost to follow-up and had had no primary care visits uh, since that time, but had been to the emergency department or hospitalization uh, or, or, and had been hospitalized once since that last visit. Now, fast forward to tonight. This is the, the scene in which um, I'll provide how this case unfolded. 
Again, I was a resident at the time here at Cincinnati Children's. Um, as is the case at most residencies, at most emergency departments, one of the residents, um, the see one of the senior residents carries a pager uh, that is known as the trauma pager. And when it goes off, uh, that resident, along with a team of other physicians, respiratory therapists, nurses, and more, runs to the trauma bay to respond to an acute need. Sometimes it's a traumatic event related to a car accident or a gunshot wound. Other times it might be an acute medical concern. And so this was um, about midnight on a Saturday night when this pager goes off. Now, anyone who's uh, carried one of these pagers before or run to the emergency rooms trauma bay in that type of setting knows that sometimes you get some information about the child or the patient that's coming in and sometimes you don't. Here's what we knew about when we were running to the bay that night. We knew that we had a nine-year-old girl with asthma. We knew that she had developed difficulty breathing over the last 12 to 24 hours. Her symptoms had progressed quickly. The family called 911 and the squad raced to her home, arriving within minutes. The squad in the field started oxygen, continuous albuterol, and I believe had also given her a dose of steroid. And then before long, she was uh, brought into the bay. This is a picture of, uh, of that uh, room at Cincinnati Children's. You can see all the equipment uh, that's around there now. If you imagine a child put on that uh, center bed and a team of medical professionals working around her. Um, when she was when she was brought into this room, we noted that she was in severe distress. She was having a, a ton of difficulty breathing, and we either continued or instituted further aggressive supportive measures, much as the ones that I've described. But unfortunately, before long, her spontaneous respiration ceased, and she stopped breathing right before our eyes. What we sometimes see in pediatrics when a child stops breathing is what soon can follow is cardiac arrest. And unfortunately, that occurred for this child and prompting us to initiate um, aggressive uh, CPR. Um, and my specific role that night was on the side of the bed um, dedicated to chest compressions. And so me and one other person rotated out every two minutes or so doing chest compressions for about 30 minutes. But unfortunately, despite our best efforts, there was never uh, a return of spontaneous circulation. And this child was pronounced dead before our, before our eyes. Uh, less than an hour after she arrived in our trauma bay. Now, that is a terrible outcome. And with terrible outcomes, we dive a little bit deeper and we learn a, bit, a little bit more later. So what did we learn? Well, this child uh, lived in an unhealthy home environment. She lived in an apartment building notorious for mold, roaches, and other complaints. She had an unresponsive landlord um, who often would threat eviction of those tenants who complained. She had barriers to prescription and clinic visit adherence. I told you that she uh, had missed some follow-up visits at our primary care center, but she had transportation challenges. She had two parents who worked um, very odd hours and if they took off work, they would um, have the threat of a lost job. And so there were reasons behind her missed visits. And then the kicker, the thing that sticks with me to this day is that she lived less than a mile from our hospital, which we think is a pretty darn good hospital, uh, but we still had a child who died from a disease whose symptoms should be controllable. So it begs the question, of course, of what can we learn from this as we seek better and more equitable outcomes? How can we prevent outcomes like this while also preventing those outcomes that may be less extreme? To lay the foundation for that discussion, I'd like to provide a little bit of background, level set a little bit on terminology, and then get into some of the work we've done specifically for asthma and for other conditions. So let's start with some background. <clears throat> First, we know that gaps in health outcomes, be it asthma or other, are often rooted in differential risks and assets experienced by children, by families, and by communities. This is true in Cincinnati. This is true in Cleveland. This is true around the world. We also know that hospitals increasingly view themselves as accountable to populations. It's not necessarily enough to just say, we treated this individual, this child, this patient, and they got better. It's also important now to think about who are we covering across our geographic area. And some of that is incentivized by mission. It is the right thing to do. But increasingly, that is also incentivized by margin. We are increasingly seeing systems that pay for value, that pay for outcomes, as opposed to the trad traditional fee-for-service model. Now, this concept of looking at the distribution of outcomes and not just the average can be termed population health. 
defined by Kindig and Stoddard in the AJPH in 2003 as the health outcomes of a group of individuals, including the distribution of such outcomes within that group. Now, there are a number of outcomes we can think about this in. One that I think is particularly telling is life expectancy. And so many of you have probably seen this map or versions of it uh, published by VCU and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, who looked at a bunch of cities across the United States and then uh, highlighted differences in life expectancy either on the interstates, on subway lines, or in uh, the inner parts of the cities versus the suburbs. This is the particular map of Cleveland, um, where you can see in certain areas, in certain zip codes, you have life expectancies of roughly 70 years. You go out to the suburbs and you see life expectancy uh, of roughly 82 years. Again, um, this is about a 10 mile uh, ride uh, between these two areas and a 12 mile or, or a 12 year difference in life expectancy. Now, I will tell you that similar variation exists in Cincinnati. Robert Wood Johnson hasn't recognized us as a city to uh, create a map for, but our local health department has. And what we've seen is similar variation, in fact, 20 year uh, life expectancy difference separated by mere miles. And so it begs, of course, the question of why. What is different between that uh, zip code here, 44103, where you see a 70 year life expectancy, and 44124, where you see 82 year life expectancy? Well, I will tell you it's a, it's a complex story which uh, runs from history. And I think it's in, important to recognize that as we consider the uh, causes of the, um, the differences of the inequities that we're seeing now. I would suggest that historical realities are impeding progress in cities um, across the United States today and help us to unearth those determinants of the determinants. And so many of you, I presume, have seen this map of Cleveland. It comes from, I believe, the 1930s. Uh, published through uh, University of Richmond, who's compiled a series of these maps uh, for cities across the United States. These are redlining maps, which look at how housing was categorized across US cities uh, by real estate agencies. And so you can see the key of this map are those uh, red neighborhoods, those red zones where the housing is considered hazardous, yellow where it's considered definitely declining, blue, where it's still desirable and green best, largely driven by who the demographics of people live there. So it was a, um, a way in which um, there could be de facto or de jure segregation um, and uh, structural racism permeating its uh, tentacles into um, the investment strategies of neighborhoods and communities. Now, I would suggest that the ramifications of this that was occurring 75 years ago persists today. And in fact, if you overlay those zip code life expectancies from the previous map, you can see it playing out in real terms. So that red zone um, up in the central part of Cleveland was the area that had a life expectancy of 70 years. That green zone um, on the suburb on the southeastern side of the city was where we saw 82 years. And I would suggest that the same uh, reality plays out in cities across our, our country. Again, highlighting the impact our own history has on our current and future status. One could term these um, aspects the social determinants of health. Now, this is a World Health Organization definition, uh, which highlights that what we are talking about now are the conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live, and age, and the wider set of forces and systems shaping the conditions of daily life. And in fact, those conditions are determined themselves by um, history, by policy, by systems, by structures that are currently in place. And we know that health outcomes are disproportionately affected by these factors, as opposed to those um, factors that we often uh, proceed with ourselves in healthcare settings. This, uh, this pie chart, this, this figure on the right was produced by the Health Policy Institute of Ohio based here in Columbus or, or based in Columbus, um, which helps us um, identify both how are we doing as a state, but also um, what is the relative contribution of certain aspects of these factors to health outcomes. And what you can see is that um, in general, clinical care is thought to um, uh, contribute about 20% of the effect of health outcomes, whereas health behaviors, physical environment, and the social and economic environment 
disproportionately determine what we see. I would also suggest that if you look at that 20% of clinical care, it's composed of elements like access to care and experience within the healthcare system, which themselves could relate to the underlying social determinants of health. Now, this being um, the topic at hand, I'd like to really consider how the physical environment influences those health outcomes, and in many respects, has a direct interplay with the social and economic environment. And I would suggest that this central relevance of environmental health um, can be broadened to include any of those conditions that occur that influence the way we bo are born, grow, work, live, and age, and can help us to think about how we can move upstream to support prevention by optimizing the health and cleanliness of our air, our water, our outdoors, and our indoors. A couple pictures to drive home this metaphor still further from the rivers that I identify with most strongly. Uh, this river right here is um, the Ohio, just upstream of Cincinnati. Again, you can see some pollutants um, being put into the river. Uh, my old home of Pittsburgh, you see the three rivers here meeting, the Monongahela here, Allegheny here, and the Ohio, which I guess is technically also upstream of Cincinnati. Again, il illustrating the degree to which the pollutants of the Monongahela, the industrial parts of Pennsylvania and West Virginia percolate into the water that flows past our cities. And finally, the Genesee River, you can see right here in uh, Rochester, New York, my hometown, um, accrual of pollution that uh, presumably was put into that river upstream and affects those who live downstream. Now, with this in mind, these upstream factors that we must confront, I think it instructive to think about what Swetland is. What is the center um, that I have the privilege to talk with today? What is the mission? It is truly to investigate the environmental determinants, those factors upstream of health inequities to translate these findings into policies and practices that promote community and population health. I think a mission um, that uh, you can be um, extremely proud of and one that I uh, have great gratitude for. But let's think about this term inequities. Let's think about how it aligns with the concept of equity and how that differs from a concept of equality. This is a figure perhaps some of you have seen, again, illustrating the difference between equality and equity. A World Health Organization definition of equity is put here as the absence of avoidable or remediable differences among groups of people. This can emerge if care is equal, even if risk differs, that drives those avoidable outcome differences or disparities, whereas equitable care matches need to resource. Now, if you look at this figure to help us understand this definition, if you imagine three kids of the same height, um, all trying to see a baseball game, but they're standing on a ground of a different level, trying to peer over a fence of a different height, uh, and you give the same resource, the same box for each to stand on, one might have an easy time seeing the game, uh, one might have to stretch and one might have no chance. Now, equity is to meet the need with the resource, providing adequate boxes so all can see the game. You know, some might say, myself included, that perhaps this picture misses the point, that uh, we should really be asking the question as we provide those boxes, perhaps, of why there is a fence there in the first place, why are kids standing on unequal ground, and why aren't they in the stands to begin with? And that's really moving toward the concept of justice, which I feel like is a, a critical component of this uh, consideration. Now, one more thought here is bringing lived experience into the mix. Again, I mentioned the, the case at the beginning, um, but that is one case among many. We've done some qualitative studies of kids who are admitted to the hospital. I'll provide some of the verbatim quotes here to, again, illustrate the degree of social and environmental determinants that influence outcomes and then also drive those equity gaps or disparities. One child who was admitted for an asthma exacerbation, the parent noted that my window is broken, there are roaches, and my landlord isn't responsive to my concerns. Again, hearkening back to what we heard at the beginning. Another, um, also for a respiratory ailment, noted that it takes four hours to get to the pharmacy, two hours to get there walking, two hours to get back. I just can't do it. Again, striking the reality of why certain families are unable to fill needed prescriptions. Similarly, related to a follow-up visit, one noted that I don't have transportation. I had to catch the bus everywhere and it was really, really hot the next day. 
And by him having a breathing problem, I was scared to catch the bus. Again, this family missed their follow-up visit. And another example, again, of a lived experience within our walls that I was in the hospital with no money, no one, no food, no gas. It was just horrible because I was breastfeeding. This is her other child. And I'm basically eating nothing but cereal or a little scrap that she, the patient, doesn't eat that I could sneak in before the doctors come and see. Again, lived experience within our own walls. And then this being a discussion primarily of environment, I'd like to um, highlight this particular quote, again, thinking about the degree to which that lived environment, that lived experience influences health outcomes. So again, we hear this type of complaint not infrequently. A few years, we did a study in partnership with the city of Cincinnati, looking at the overlay of asthma uh, utilization events, emergency department visits and hospitalizations and housing code violation density. What you're looking at now is a map of Cincinnati. Um, the areas in yellow are those with a relatively low asthma utilization rate and the areas in red are those with a relatively high asthma utilization rate, again, normalized by population. What I'll do now though is overlay housing code violations as defined by the city of Cincinnati's health and building departments, looking a bit like pictures um, taken with permission in homes of our patients. You know, again, you can see uh, falling in ceilings, you can see broken glass, you can see roaches. And I can tell you that there's this clear link where housing code violation density accounted for 22% of the asthma utilization rate variation, even after adjustment for underlying poverty. Again, suggesting that that quality of the built environment um, was having a real effect on the health and well-being of children. The case I um, illustrated at the start, I'll provide some more close up data on this in a moment, um, but just to encircle the neighborhood where this child was from uh, is right here, that red neighborhood in the center called Avondale. The H is where Cincinnati Children's is located. Now, this uh, set of data is, uh, has a companion uh, with a very differential rate of asthma utilization across our neighborhoods. I'm gonna show you some old data that informed some of the improvement work that I will then get into. These data are looking at asthma admission rates across Hamilton County, Ohio neighborhoods um, from 2010 to 2012. So if you look at the X axis, or the, I'm sorry, the Y axis, it is that admission rate per neighborhood per year per thousand children. And the X axis are the 80 or 90 neighborhoods that make up our county. And what I want you to focus on here is not the fine print, don't get your magnifying glasses out to read the neighborhoods unless perhaps you're from Cincinnati and are curious. It's more as you look from left to right on this figure, the sheer variation that you see. You have some neighborhoods on the left, with admission rates in excess of 20 per thousand, some on the right uh, with zero over this three year period. For context, here is the county average and here is the best data that I could find for national average. Again, illustrative of the degree to which some neighborhoods do much better, some neighborhoods do much worse. So why? Uh, some of our research uh, from interviewing families um, suggests that children from the red neighborhoods are far more likely um, to report exposure to cockroaches, to lack reliable transportation, to live in poverty, and to have a depressed parent, all things associated with adverse asthma outcomes, and many of which um, were uh, true for the child that I introduced at the start, who again lived in the red neighborhood of Avondale. These are also, of course, all social determinants of health, which informed our move toward improvement. Now, because of these data um, and because of a renewed focus by the hospital on community health and well being, um, there was the institution of an asthma improvement collaborative to explicitly focus on identifying and then uh, narrowing equity gaps. And so, back um, at about the time these data were collected, um, a smart aim, an improvement aim, was made to reduce asthma related hospitalizations and ED visits for Medicaid insured children aged two to 17 years in Hamilton County by 20% by June 30th, 2015. This was a big job, a big improvement plan. And so in turn, a phased and multidisciplinary team-based approach was pursued, accruing population level data, refining theory, and tracking activities and time series. 
Now, for those of you who are familiar with improvement methods, one of the first things um, you often do is identify those key drivers um, of uh, what needs to occur um, for um, improvements to take place. This is in essence the theory built on, on literature, built on talking with families, built on expert experience. And so I won't go through each of these in detail, except to say that we wanted to figure out how to optimize prevention, um, enhance wraparound supports, mitigate those challenges families were facing in their homes, and ensure reliable contact and follow-up across the care spectrum. These drivers mapped to a series of interventions, some that I'll walk through in a moment, um, that occurred in phases with some overlap. Phase one was how can we optimize and improve the work that we're doing inside the hospital um, for those who are admitted for asthma exacerbations. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about these, but how do we give meds in hand so that everyone goes home with albuterol, their steroid if they need it, and a controller medicine if indicated. We enhanced a risk assessment pathway that bolstered our evaluation of the home environment and we pursued um, something called the CLEAR program, which is a connection to sanitarians within um, the health and building department to address code violations. We also pursued a home health pathway where nurses could go out to the home um, and help families troubleshoot um, the post uh, uh, discharge period. Phase two was more outpatient based, both in primary care and subspecialty care, thinking about asthma care coordination to help follow families across the spectrum. A partnership with local pharmacies around medication home delivery. And then uh, um, ultimately phase three was a community-based um, set of programs that in large part uh, built on partnerships with the schools, developed shared registries um, so that there could be um, sharing of information with school nurses and child help, which I'll talk more about in a moment, which, was our, which is our partnership with legal aid. But let's just briefly walk through some of the hospital-based changes to care processes. Again, on discharge, uh, we made sure that medications were delivered to the rooms before discharge, a follow-up appointment was made, and an asthma action plan was put into place. Spoke a minute ago about asthma home health, um, but we also ensured that uh, there were more robust connections routinely to uh, supports like social work and CLEAR. These were driven by an asthma-specific history and physical, uh, portions of which are visible on this screenshot on the right part of this screen which um, links to a clinical care guideline, walks through severity assessments, provides some decision support and more um, detailed social and environmental histories that link directly towards programs like CLEAR. In the outpatient realm, our asthma care coordinators, as I mentioned a moment ago, um, target um, high-risk children who have utilized um, lots of care in the preceding months. They support those connections um, between clinic visits via phone follow-up, helping with scheduling appointments and providing continuous education over time. They also help to address psychosocial barriers and connect families to uh, community-based resources, including the pharmacies that I mentioned a moment ago. They help to automate medication fills and refills. Uh, those medications can often be sent either to the home or to a preferred address. And that ultimately led to a fill rate among care coordinated patients. Again, those that were some of our highest risk increased from 20 to 75%. We've also sought to bridge to the community. The Cincinnati Child Health Law Partnership is our partnership with Legal Aid Society. They work in our primary care office and uh, under normal times are there uh, four to five days per week, helping families navigate housing concerns, public benefit denials or delays, and other legal issues common among those living in poverty. Uh, since 2008, this partnership has affected more than 8,000 of our families, reducing social determinants uh, uh, related risks, uh, asthma related housing exposures, and we're starting to see early evidence of a decrease in hospitalizations and bed days, in particular for those with asthma and housing concerns. There's also um, the um, interesting side effect that we've noted that um, are helping us to expand our ability to recognize patterns. A brief uh, uh, story of a case that occurred, this is now a number of years ago, um, in some of the same building complexes where the child I introduced at the start lived, where um, 
Over a very hot spring and early summer, physicians were making multiple referrals for pests, for mold, and for these interesting and different air conditioning complaints. The right side that you see here is a PDF screenshot of a letter that we uh, began to get lots of uh, examples from for kids saying that uh, residents would be evicted immediately if they put an air conditioning unit in their, uh, in their particular unit. Now, because these referrals were coming from lots of physicians within our practice, but came to a, a discrete number of legal advocates, soon uh, the team realized that, that these were all coming from the same absentee landlord who managed 19 buildings across Cincinnati and 670 Section 8 units. Uh, the properties were in the process of going through foreclosure with um, numerous outstanding code violations. And so the advocates were able to help individual families, but they were also able to assist in formation of a tenant association, essentially moving from one patient to 16 households to tenants of all 670 units. And so this pattern led, this, this is one of the buildings with um, some pictures from inside, uh, a, a large apartment building in disrepair that soon led to um, individual units being fixed up and new roofs being put in for, uh, again, widespread repair that didn't just affect the one, but affected the many. And happily, the story continued that soon that those buildings did go through complete foreclosure. They were put under new management by a, a group called the Community Builders, who uh, with uh, the neighborhood of Avondale received a large uh, grant to allow for major renovations to the five largest complexes. Uh, also another grant that allowed them to uh, develop a core group of building champions um, to focus explicitly on the health, education, and safety of tenants within these buildings. So again, a wonderful story of the one moving to the many. Again, a picture of what this looked like at the start. You see, you can see what the building currently looks like. This pattern recognition is a key strategy that we've tried to leverage. This idea that risk often overlaps with uh, one another. Um, this is a zoomed in map of Avondale. <clears throat> the background of the map is the same that I showed earlier. Um, where we look at red to yellow with respect to asthma utilization rates. Um, the, um, uh, the black triangles are representative of asthma, or, or not asthma, housing code violations. And the yellow circles are asthma emergency visits and admissions for, for children. And what we soon saw was that Avondale itself was in the top, top, top five for asthma utilization, the top five for housing code violations, and there was discernible overlap between the triangles and the circles, supporting then collaboration between healthcare, legal aid, public health, and building to try and begin to recognize what are some of those buildings that are um, notorious and in need of repair. This being one of them, another one of the buildings that um, was uh, drastically renovated over the last uh, four or five years. Now, of course, there have been other community connections. I've mentioned uh, the Cincinnati Health Department, school nurses to ensure that we have updated and accurate asthma action plans, that we pursue routine asthma control test assessments in schools, as well as built capability to ensure that we are able to confront um, asthma exacerbations when they occur. And I will tell you all told, again, this is a, a gross simplification of the story, but over time we've seen um, a, a nice reduction um, in some of the measures that we've been tracking. This is a, um, a look at the um, uh, Medicaid uh, patient uh, admission rate over time. Um, and we saw that when we start from the time we started to the current time, the hospitalization rate has fallen about 40% from 8.1 to 4.7 per 10,000 Medicaid patients. In parallel, so too has the ED visit rate fallen, reutilization rates following an admission have gone down and improvements have been sustained to this day. So it begs the question, of course, of how can we move beyond asthma? Well, given the successes we began to show in asthma leading up into 2015, Cincinnati Children's doubled down in a focus on community health in preparation for a 2020 strategic plan that explicitly now states 
that we will help Cincinnati's 66,000 children be the healthiest in the nation through strong community partnerships. Now to do that, um, they, uh, the board approved uh, four key areas of work, um, targeting elimination of infant mortality, ensuring that all five-year-olds have a healthy mind and body, that with Cincinnati Public Schools, children read proficiently by third grade, and then finally, in the area that I spend most of my time thinking about, um, how might we reduce disparities in hospital admissions across neighborhoods? Now, we've talked about asthma quite a bit so far, but what I would suggest is that the causes at the root of asthma-related disparities extend elsewhere. So what you're looking at here on a normalized scale is the uh, relative inpatient bed day rate across causes uh, by neighborhood across certain conditions. And I've just pulled out uh, those neighborhoods that are the most impoverished in red compared to the least impoverished in blue. And since this is on a normalized scale, um, it's as if each neighborhood, it can, or, or it's as if each condition contributed the same number of bed days. And what I would suggest is that the county average being zero for every condition that we assessed respiratory infections like bronchiolitis pneumonia, injury, asthma, epilepsy, gastroenteritis, appendicitis, EDKA. The red line is above that, me that mean, the blue line is below that mean. And calling out asthma and respiratory infections in particular being our two most common reasons for admission, we particularly um, starkly see those differences by uh, socioeconomic status. So this led to the work that we've been focused on the last number of years to say, okay, what are the hot spots of all cause inpatient bed days, not just asthma, not just respiratory infections, and what can we do to narrow those gaps? And so the map that you see on the left is Hamilton County, Ohio, Cincinnati resides within it. The red zones are those hot spots and the blue areas are those relatively cool spots. And what we know is that those areas in red tend to be of high poverty, have old housing stock and have disproportionate exposure to uh, pollutants, both social and environmental. We also know that they have certain assets, many of which were leveraged during the asthma work relating to schools, social service agencies, primary care and school-based health centers and pharmacies. And so we sought out to learn deeply and ideally improve outcomes in two particularly high-risk neighborhoods, Avondale is one, and Price Hill as another to the west, specifically that we would reduce the inpatient bed day rate by 10% in these target neighborhoods by the end of the academic year 2020. And we followed much the same playbook that we had for asthma. We developed some key drivers, again, that will likely look similar if you read through them, and map those drivers to interventions. Here are those that were pursued at the child or family level related to consistent risk identification, and equity-minded deployment of resources, some health system-based efforts that helped us to learn from each hospitalization and um, extend academic or clinical community partnerships into the healthcare system, and then also community, thinking about how we could leverage pattern recognition to drive change that was ideally co-designed uh, with partners and families. So let's think about that first one first putting the child and family at the center of equity-minded care meant really thinking about what it meant to um, have the right treatment at the right time and the right place, scaling up programs like medication delivery, building relationships with families and community partners central to care, and also helping families navigate care uh, when there are challenges. And so one of the ways we did that was to proactively identify those who were medically or socially at risk and connect them either to care managers um, or community health workers, or both. We also built out our risk stratification and prediction capabilities, again, thinking about segmentation in important ways to help drive those connections to resources like care managers and community health workers. A word on daily learning from each hospitalization. Still, every morning between 7 and 7.30, our electronic health record sends me and my team an email, an alert, um, that tells us whether any child from Avondale or Price Hill has been ad admitted to the hospital. Um, if so, there is a morning huddle that results, much like a safety huddle, where we review the case to determine potential root causes of that admission, identify preventive care gaps that might be closed during the stay, and determination of transition needs 
that could be put into place before discharge. With the kind of building trust and moving toward the community uh, focus, we've uh, worked through uh, what we call the All Children Thrive Learning Network, which brings community partners and families together with the healthcare system to learn together and improve together. Some groups that have developed out of that uh, network include the Caring Families Group, pictured here at the bottom, a group of parents who coach one another um, in increasing in-home healthy behaviors. One of their early areas of focus was increased in-home reading. A second group of great pertinence to the topic at hand is what we call justice promoters, a neighbor to neighbor uh, coaching um, program that focuses on legal rights, in, including renter and landlord interactions. And then a Price Hill based program, the Healthy Homes Block by Block group where neighbors physically go door to door or at least did before we uh, found ourselves um, amidst a global pandemic collecting with neighbors to deliver books and safety supplies and provide education and coaching. We've also, of course, continued to work toward getting to root causes, understanding the risks and benefits within neighborhoods. You know, just an example of a series of maps of Cincinnati, this first one looking at crime so we can understand the breadth of crime within um, our communities. This picture is a vigil that was, uh, is a picture of a, a vigil of, of a, uh, site where a 15 year old was murdered in one of our neighborhoods. Again, thinking about risks that our families face, adverse childhood experiences many face each day. We've talked a lot about the physical environment, housing code violations that um, exist across our neighborhoods. There's the economic environment. This is a map of poverty and this is the produce section in the Avondale neighborhood, three or four rotten bananas. As well as the health services or access environment, um, one thing I did recently was just look at a Google map time from the center of Price Hill to our um, primary care center at about three o'clock in the afternoon. This three or four mile journey would take an hour and 15 minutes for a family that needed to catch the bus. Now these are risks. Of course, they could be replaced with assets with those good things that are also present within these neighborhoods that could be leveraged. The top left, you see a reading on Reading Road event uh, organized by one of the groups that I mentioned a moment ago. Again, building social capital and will within this uh, particular neighborhood. You can see attempts at beautifying neighborhoods and making them safer and more uh, vibrant places to live. The top right, the economic environment, you can see a produce pop-up put together by our schools and, and food banks, um, particularly around the time COVID hit. And you can also see a picture of our mobile unit, which we're about to test um, out as we move toward uh, again, bringing the right care to the uh, right place at the right time. And I will tell you that we've seen some good progress. Um, these are the way in which we've tracked our data with respect to our bed day goal. On the left, you see our primary chart that we track. The y-axis is a bed day rate per thousand children measured per month. The x-axis is time measured in months. And what you can see from this chart is that soon after we began our work here in the summer of 2015, um, our average uh, bed day rate went down and has kind of stayed down with some variability ever since, indicative of an 18% decrease in our target neighborhoods. Some comparison neighborhoods are, are noted on the right, um, suggestive of no significant decrease. Again, adding um, some uh, uh, reality to our uh, belief and conclusion that we're making progress. Indeed, that we've seen about a 20% reduction equating to about 150 days each year where Avondale and Price Hill children um, uh, are at home and not the hospital. Our partners in the other work have seen similar project progress with fewer extreme preterm births, an increase in thriving children um, in our primary care office and an increase in third grade reading proficiency across our schools. But the reality is, is that we have ample room for further improvement. This is the start, not the finish. And as we move forward uh, toward where we go next, we continue to leverage these core working principles. Equity is foundational. Children and families remain at the center of our work. We work together on solutions, building relationships and building trust. We are humble that we all teach, yes, but we also must be prepared to learn. And that we focus on action and focus on results. 
This is um, helping inform where we are now, looking forward, not just to 2021 or 2025, but to 2033 when Cincinnati Children's will have its 150th birthday. And we uh, will truly aim to achieve um, that uh, healthiest in the nation status by focusing on achieving excellent and equitable health outcomes inside our healthcare system and in partnership with the community, that all of our children can remain on a path to their full potential and that they can do so feeling safe and supported with their families. Now, of course, in the last couple of minutes, I do want to make note that all of this work is now occurring under a very uh, different backdrop. And how can we maintain these aspirations amid a global pandemic? How can we apply these core principles to uh, the challenges we all face today? And I'd like to introduce these last couple minutes, this discussion by looking at this photo on the right. This is a photo that was published in the Cincinnati Inquirer in 1918, our daily paper um, during the midst of the influenza epidemic of that time. And what you see is again, masked individuals. You also see a, a food pantry that was serving children outside. Um, a picture that though the uh, clothing um, may look a little bit different uh, could just as easily be uh, taken um, earlier today or earlier this year. Importantly, as we've moved toward this response to COVID-19, however, uh, we leveraged the uh, core principles I showed a moment ago and first sought to assess from our families what is most important to you at this time. They told us consistently that trusted messaging was key, that strong partnerships built on proactive outreach meeting basic needs and maintaining social connectedness would support a move toward prevention of both adverse experiences as a result of COVID-19, as well as all those other things that still continue. They also um, told us, um, as well as our partners in the community, that they needed equity-oriented, real-time, transparent measurement. Um, I will say a moment about that, um, uh, 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 another comment about that, particularly with some of our guests from Wuhan on the line today that much of what we are doing from a measurement strategy today has been driven by best efforts across the globe to try and say, what measures could we use to understand transmission, incidents, and extent of pandemic that will help us understand how well or how poorly we are doing instituting non-pharmaceutical interventions like masking and distancing, as well as how can we address challenges to lived experience. And so as we think about the environment in COVID-19, we know that certain populations, including many of our families are at added risk of exposure, both to the virus as well as to the, the other effects. They are disproportionately essential workers, also with increased exposure to toxic chemicals and potentially uh, confined spaces and unhealthy environments. Our schools are currently open. They may not be for long, but they are currently open um, when they are closed, how many of our kids are confined to spaces that might themselves be unhealthy, more food and housing insecurity, <clears throat> socioeconomic, racial, and ethnic gaps are then, of course, influenced by those living conditions, work circumstances for families or parents, underlying health conditions that are already disproportionately high among those who are disadvantaged and marginalized, and differential access to care, much as we've been discussing throughout the day. We are trying to think through uh, these factors as we promote equity in our response. As we consider testing equity, we are using some of those same mapping skills that we've done before to think about um, underlying factors like population density, accessibility, and socioeconomic deprivation to understand where we might um, put testing facilities. This is a map that was developed by some of my colleagues called Brocamp, Rashmi Sakai, and um, Erica Rasnick. It's Hamilton County, the backing here is looking at socioeconomic deprivation. The purple, or I'm sorry, the pink dots represent uh, metropolitan housing, public housing uh, buildings. And the kind of shadowed effect that you see are those who are within a 10 minute walking distance of a current testing site. We're using this type of method to say, where are we not adequately uh, covering and how could we do so better? We are also, of course, leveraging our partnerships to address challenges like job loss or lack of pay, public benefit uncertainties and adverse in-home conditions. 
um, with solutions like community-based community experts, legal aid, and more, who are lending their voice, data, and expertise to the response. There was a particularly wonderful um, article in the Wall Street Journal not long ago that celebrated some of those efforts of our local legal aid um, agencies. I'll just read this brief snippet um, from this um, woman, Ms. McBerry, who lives in our backyard, who notes that the Legal Aid Society of Greater Cincinnati helped her access public assistance funds enough to make her rent in June and July. She's back to working five full days and works several hours on Saturday and Sunday, 50 hours a week in all. I just have to keep myself going, make sure I'm safe and my family is safe, she said. It's not even worries anymore, it's part of living now, it's life. And for all um, expectations it will be for the coming months, these are the types of stories, these are the types of challenge we will need to continue to address. So to conclude, I hope I've made it clear that socio-environmental and medical conditions drive asthma outcomes and outcomes across conditions, that there's the importance of working upstream, addressing those determinants as well as determinants of those determinants, that to use the words of the Sweatland vision, we all have a special obligation to leverage diverse skills and experiences through transformative research, training, and engagement to achieve environmental health equity. We must pursue innovative strategies inside and outside of healthcare, and we must be civically active and engaged in our own setting. It would um, be a disservice of mine to not note that one week from today is election day, and that we all must do our part to understand how that vote affects our patients and our communities. And that we all must be prepared to learn from our patients or those we interact with, um, much as the case um, that I introduced at the start, um, has been true for me, I would suggest that patients like her, families like hers, and community partners like I interact with every day are often our best teachers. Now I will close with this quote from Rachel Carson. Again, this is environmentally mediated. This is from an environmental uh, preserve, a Rachel Carson preserve in Maine uh, that I have long gone to, a picture I took years ago in a fall much like this one where she notes in Silent Spring that most of us walk unseeing through the world, unaware alike of its beauties, its wonders, and the strange and sometimes terrible intensity of the lives that are being lived about us. Reminding us to be aware of those beauties and wonders, but also to be aware of the intensity of the lives of our patients and our partners. So I will close there and I look forward uh, to any uh, questions and comments you might have. Many thanks. Dr. Beck, thank you so much for this uh, exciting presentation. And uh, we have a couple of questions, but uh, first of all, I'd like to recognize that this is, these are the kind of stories that we would like to read in newspapers and that would provide us with hope that there are things that we can all do to change uh, the way in which we are all living and ensuring that we can, uh, that our human potential can be uh, taking to, to its best level. So uh, some of the questions that we have here uh, are uh, also administrative in, in a way. And I'll start by asking you, so could you describe a little bit about the staffing needed to conduct all these improvements like in hospitals, care coordination and community level improvements, follow up by a, a question by Dr. Karen Malloy uh, from University Hospitals where she uh, and Case Western uh, who asks, uh, so how were the community interventions funded to and, and all this work that you're talking about? Yes, so I, both very good questions, um, some simpler than others. So some interventions um, we instituted um, either with some pilot funds to get it started. And then once it was started, we didn't really need much else. It just kind of fl flowed into uh, the, the kind of standard uh, care provided. So examples of that related to some of our medication delivery programs, which are services offered by local pharmacies that we just are now better at leveraging. Similarly with um, some of the work we've done with the health and building departments, these are um, uh, visits um, that anyone can request. We've just uh, tried to work it into our care flow a little bit more easily. Now, clearly other things we've done have taken more um, effort and more funding. Um, I would say, um, uh, I'd put it into a couple of different buckets. 
There are some things that we do um, that uh, leverage funds from some shared shared savings model, shared savings models from uh, Medicaid. So um, some of our um, care uh, management and community health worker approaches um, use funds from some of those programs um, to enable uh, connections to uh, patients in sustainable ways. Now, other kind of larger scale improvement um, uh, efforts that we've done have taken um, a combination of investments from the hospital to say, we believe this is important. We are going to invest some funds for um, uh, salary support of faculty, of quality improvement consultants, analysts, um, and project managers. Um, but we are also going to identify ways uh, where uh, we can work with uh, either grant funders uh, or philanthropists to supplement uh, this investment. The last thing that I'll mention um, that we are exploring more avidly is that uh, to date in this part of the state, our uh, pay for value or value-based um, kind of a, an accountable care type model has not been our reality, but that is uh, showing signs of changing. Um, it's delayed, been delayed a little bit on account of the pandemic, um, but that might provide us with more avenues to say if we can uh, use research to make the argument um, to funders that these are uh, beneficial and potentially a positive return on investment, it may be that something like legal aid or an alternative approach like that might have a way of being uh, funded uh, through care. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I, we have just a couple more minutes here and we have uh, two, two questions. And I'll ask uh, one of our participants, uh, Dor Dearborn, if she is or he is able to uh, present uh, or post a question, I hope that you can you are on mute right now, and if you would like to, you can please introduce yourself and, and pose the question to Dr. Beck. Uh, so can you hear me now? We can, yes. yes. So, Andrew, this is really great to see the comprehensive program that you put together. Uh, I recall hearing and talking to you about it early on years ago, and it's so great to see it flourish so well and the successes that you're having. And particularly, uh, I'm really pleased that you've been able to pull in the funding from multiple sources. It's one thing to get grants, but to get sustainability funding beyond that, it would appear uh, uh, that you've had both success in getting proactive funding from your hospital system, but also your, your county facilities. Can you discuss it, but particularly your interaction with the state Medicaid and have you been able to pull them in in a meaningful funding way? Yeah, so thank you, Dr. Dearborn. And and I, I greatly appreciate that you're on this call. So much of, of your work has informed so much of this. And so it's it's nice to nice to at least hear you. Um, the um, yes, so Medicaid has has um, been at the table um, over the years for some of this. Uh, the kind of accountable care type program that I alluded to a moment ago is on the near horizon now um, with um, us here in the southwestern part of the state where um, Ohio Medicaid and Medicaid managed care companies are partnering with children's um, to move more fully in a direction of paying for outcomes or, or value. Um, and I do think that's gonna help us align with them around some common objectives and aims. Um, so um, in a direct way, um, we have not really started that yet, but that will likely be um, an area of great focus uh, for this upcoming calendar year, as that program is likely gonna start in January. Um, so the point is very well taken and one we're very much trying to align on. Thank you so much. And we, we will allow for one more question. We have a lot of interest actually here. Uh, sadly, we only have a limited amount of time, but uh, Tim Shuselski from uh, the Swedland Center. And Tim, I think you are unmuted and you are able to pose your question. Awesome. awesome. Thanks, Roberto. And uh, thanks, Dr. Beck. This is a great talk. Uh, your work really demonstrates the upstream fundamental drivers of bad outcomes in communities are you know, often both identifiable in EMR 
and modifiable, um, which is really encouraging um, <laughs> to the, the, those of us in the audience. Um, but just in brief, you know, it seems like this could have this general approach could have broad value beyond severe illness, beyond hospitalization, uh, depending on how you deployed it. You know, could you use clinic data possibly to identify um, things like lead exposure hotspots or uh, just neurocognitive problems, um, uh, things of that ilk? Yeah, so I think I think some of the methods that we've used could have great um, extension to other places. Um, one of my colleagues here. Dr. Nick Newman, uh, who I imagine many of you you all know, is um, in charge of our Environmental Health Center, and we've had some conversations around just that topic. Um, he's run some preliminary numbers, and and I'd like to think we could extend it still further. Um, but yes, I, I think there's, you know, when when we're dealing with such common root causes, I think common methods could could take us a good a good length of the way. And I would suggest that you know some of the drivers of what we're seeing. Uh, in asthma or frankly across many different conditions would clearly extend uh, to lead and other uh, environmental exposures. Thank you. Uh, sadly, we are at the end of uh, our time, uh, but we would like to thank you. Uh, uh, we appreciate so much, not only uh, the knowledge that you're bringing, but also that you're inspiring us to to act upon the information that we have, right? Which I think it's what we all want to achieve in the end to ensure that po population health can be um, uh, addressed and that we can improve uh, the health of the, the, the people that we work with. So Dr. Beck, uh, on behalf of the Sutherland Center, thank you so much for this opportunity of hearing about your research and your work uh, in, in the Cincinnati area. Thank you all. Thank you everyone. <laughs>